I want to say one very, very important thing, which is that we're in this for fun. We're in this to be happy. There's nothing greater than being healthy and fit. There's nothing that will bring happiness than being healthier and, and knowing how to become even healthier still and also uh, with fitness, you know, to see that we're now able to run at a faster pace at the same level of intensity at the same heart rate or generate more power what a what a happy feeling that is and 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 being in a race and having fun if your goal is to race being able to have unlimited energy being able to have a wonderful brain that uh that is really sharp no matter what your age these are these are the things that that bring happiness and are fun and and we can't forget the fun part in all that we're, we're doing. Hello, my name is Flores German from the Extra Miles Show. And today we bring back our friend Dr. Phil Maffetone on the podcast. Many of the listeners of this podcast are already familiar with his work. He is a researcher, a clinician, and a coach. And he has written more than 20 different books in the field of nutrition, sport medicine, and biofeedback. He even wrote the first book on heart rate training in the 1980s. So definitely a lot of experience with heart rate training right there. Um, in today's podcast, we've taken a deeper dive into some of the topics that we previously haven't covered yet. If you're unfamiliar with some of the terminology that we use, such as math training or the 180 formula, I highly suggest you read the article Math Training and 180 Formula on Dr. Phil Maffetone's website and I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. Very excited to announce an actual giveaway that we're going to be doing with Path Projects for one out of three running hooded shirts. And that's actually the shirt that I'm wearing right now. This is the Pyrenees hooded shirt. It comes with several great features such as a GPS watch slot. So you can actually be running outside in the cold and you can just have your watch over there still showing your heart rate and your pace. It comes with hand covers to keep your hands warm. You can even tuck in your fingers if your fingers get cold. And then it comes with a running hoodie as well. This is actually a snorkel hood so that if you're running into the wind, it doesn't blow off. And even when you look sideways, it doesn't cover your face. You can also run with a beanie or a hat underneath it. And so yes, with a hat underneath your um, hooded shirt, it's actually a nice way to keep some of the rain or some of the water out of your face as well. So this is actually what I use on some of my colder weather runs. It's great for the temperature anywhere from 30 Fahrenheit, so around the freezing point, zero Celsius, up until about 60 Fahrenheit, so about 15 Celsius. But you can also wear it at colder weather conditions if you wear a t-shirt under it or if you put a jacket over it. You can enter for a chance to win at pathprojects.com slash flow. And um, yeah, three lucky winners going to be choosing there. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Phil Maffetone. Welcome to the Extra Miles Show, Dr. Phil Maffetone. I'm very happy to have you back on here. Thanks, Floris. It's really great to be here. It's been too long, but uh, it's great to see you. Yes, definitely. We've spoken several times over the last years. The first time I had you on the show was about six years ago. And we covered a lot of different topics from heart rate monitor training, to nutrition and stress management, the mindset. We have talked in another episode about three years ago about nutrition and a deep dive on that topic. And very happy to have you back over here because there's been so many follow-up questions and so many follow-up topics, even things that are happening right now in the world that I really want to get you back on the podcast. Um, and also you've recently launched um, your very first uh, MEF Fundamentals of MEF Foundation training course that I want to take a deep dive into. So um, so let, let's start it off. Sure. Sounds great to me. Good. So obviously... 2020 and even 2021 are, are basically years that we haven't seen before. Like this is 
with the pandemic happening, a lot of athletes are experiencing quite higher stress levels in one way or another, whether that is financial stress, health stress, just insecurities about what's going on. So I've, I've noticed in many different athletes in my environment and even with myself at certain stages during this pandemic that um, some of the math times or some of the, the training times have actually slowed down a little bit. Can you talk a little bit more about that relationship between stress and aerobic running pace? Sure, that's a that's a, a very important issue. It's a it's a great question because we are in the midst of um, we could call it a stress pandemic. Uh, whatever we whatever we call it, the fact is, uh, so many people are are under the stress of um, what's going on in the world. And that stress can come from all kinds of places and stress affects us. It affects our brain, which then impairs fat burning. And so once we uh, reduce the, the, the energy pipeline from fat, uh, we, we can't perform as well. Just the opposite of what happened in the beginning when we start using MAF and we start eating better and training better and so forth, and, and we build up our fat burning, that increased energy gives us the ability to run faster at the same heart rate. So in terms of stress, I, I always have to emphasize this because when we, when we bring up that word stress, um, it makes most people think of mental, emotional stress. And this certainly is the case, and in particular with what's going on today, um, but we also have physical stress and we also have biochemical stress, which is where nutrition and metabolize, metabolism and in particular fat burning, uh, is, is, um, is, is discussed. So, uh, we look at stress in a very holistic way. That's been my approach, um, from the beginning and, um, and, the bottom line, like I say, is that stress impairs fat burning and that uh, reduces our pace at the same heart rate. It reduces our power at the same heart rate. Um, and just just looking at it from a fat burning standpoint, that's that's uh, the, really the reason. From a more general standpoint, stress, of course, because uh, we stimulate that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis uh, we produce more cortisol and so forth. That's how fat burning gets diminished. But that overall also increases uh, or also diminishes our health uh, as well as fitness. So that's um, that stress factor is a big a big issue. Yeah. So so when athletes are are experiencing some of this higher stress and they still want to obviously be active, they want to go outside, they want to work out. Um, but some of the races have been canceled or some races uh, like we don't know what's going to happen w with them. Do you have any suggestions as far as for how would you adjust your training? Like if, if you're truly experiencing high stress levels and you're truly feeling like, all right, my resting heart rate is higher. I notice possibly my meth pace is slowing down a bit. What are some recommendations as far as for adjusting your, your training? Well, it's 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 interesting because um, and all that is happening. People are, are are getting slower because of the stress, and um, they're getting stressed because races are canceled, and they're not um, benef benefiting from you know that that test of their fitness uh, and so forth. Um, but one of the great things about MAF is that your brain adapts to stress automatically. So we don't have to think, well, uh, I feel stressed today, so maybe I'll, um, I'll train differently. Your, your heart rate's going to tell you that already. So you go out, and now you're running slower, um, and you clearly see that stress is affecting your performance. And the, the next question people need to ask themselves is, how am I going to deal with this? And the, the answer is that I'm, I'm, I'm stressed because um, I can't go to my favorite espresso bar or I, 
um, my for, business for, for, is affected. First world issues, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, my business is affected. I, I can't do my Sunday long run with all my friends. Uh, I can't go to the gym. I can't go to the pool, whatever. Um, the fact is, uh, we are uh, where we are. And, and the, you know, the old idea of be here now, live in the moment is very important in, in this um, environment. And uh, by doing that, we, we actually can remove some of that stress. And some people will notice, well, gee, if they really meditate on that, um, that, that type of uh, mentality, which is a very healthy thing to do, um, they'll notice that they're actually able to run a little faster um, at the same heart rate. And that's just an example of removing some of that stress that we are able to, to remove. We can't, we can't get rid of the, uh, the, the reports about um, infection rates or um, whatever. However, we can avoid listening to the news or reading newspapers because there's just so much hype there. There's so much false information. Uh, and I'm not talking about false rumors on social media. That's a big problem in itself. But we're talking about the, you know, the, the, the mainstream uh, news media um, uh, transmitting information that's just not accurate. And it leads to panic. And the problem we have now with COVID to a large degree is the panic. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm well aware of how serious the infection rates are, the death rates. Of course, we know the vulnerabilities, which are for the most part preventable. Um, and so um, being aware of all these things um, is again, a, a way of eliminating some of the stress that we are capable of eliminating and our brain then can better adapt to the stress that we may not be able to control. Yeah, so so well said. And even when I'm looking at some of the things you mentioned here about mindful running and being aware of your surroundings and being present, that alone, like once you're running and you start to stop overthinking, and, and I notice that quite a bit with people, even with this math training approach, they would go out for a math test and they're almost over stressing themselves that they perform worse at a math test or all of a sudden they're trying to focus and on cadence and on stride length and on low heart rate and on all of these different things at once that it, it almost becomes not a flow state of running or relaxed running. And like once you can kind of remove yourself from some of those things, that that it all starts flowing much better. What a great word. You used it twice, flow. Uh, what flow is, really, is, is the ability to allow our brain to control things. We, we should be able to go out and run naturally. And running naturally means our brain knows what to do. We don't have to overthink it. We don't even have to think it. We just go out and run. We don't have to say, let's say I'm going to put my right foot forward now. Oh, now I'm going to shift. You know, we obviously it's a silly example, but it's what people often do. And we're in a society where we're bombarded with all that information from uh, the, the running magazines, from the web uh, site blogs, from um, our, our, our colleagues, from our uh, training partners, uh, we talk about um, uh, stride length, we talk about cadence, we talk about, uh, you know, what happens when we start running up a hill, what happens on the downhills. Um, it's, I mean, we've all studied it, we all read about it. Um, there's some fascinating scientific uh, information that relates to all that. And, but when we step out the door, it's time to turn all that off and flow. Go with the flow. Just run <laughs> I love naturally. It. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's that simple. Um, and, you know, we I, I often have to come back to that fact that humans get better naturally because their brain knows how to get better. Mm -hmm. And 
let your brain let your brain do it. Of course, you need a healthy brain, and it it's it's particularly helpful when the body is healthy as well, and that fitness level will build automatically. Yeah, yeah, and and even on some of my my own runs, when I've even done math tests, if I start to think a lot. I even like at that point, you're talking about just a few beats difference, right? But once you you've removed that thought that you can see the pace increase again, it's, it's fascinating. Feedback, um, uh, mechanism that, that, um, it's biofeedback. We're, we're, we're getting, uh, back information from the heart monitor, wherever you have them. And, and that information, um, gets into your brain and you say, oh, I see this is changing. Therefore, I'm going to make this change. And that's that's what biofeedback is. And I would always, um, years ago, tell the story um, when I would go for a run at my lunch break uh, uh, from my clinic. And um, it was a route I had, a regular route. And um, uh, it was a nice, relaxing route, except there, there were two Dobermans. <laughs> Um, uh, at one, at, you know, I'd pass this one house, there were two Dobermans and they'd usually be tied up, but sometimes they weren't. And whether they're tied up or not, as I approached that house, my heart rate would go up. So now here I am going by a house with two Dobermans who may not be tied up and I want to get by that house as fast as I can. But now I have to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 biofeedback, um, and and it it's really what what is um, a, a very important component of of MAF. The other good one is when you start stand on the start line of a race and you actually look down on your watch and look look at the difference between your normal resting heart rate and what what the mindset can do at that point too. Oh yeah, it's it's yeah. you know it's. I, sure, it's important to measure our our morning resting heart rate because it's such a nice um, it's such a nice indication over time. But a lot of people who uh, first started wearing heart monitors, I would I would say to them, wear it all day long, and pay attention to what your heart rate does. If you're commuting in your car in rush hour traffic, if you're on a train, if you're in your office, if you're going into a meeting. Um, if you're having, uh, heated discussions with your boss or with whoever, um, and, and, and see how stress affects you through the day, how your heart rate goes up and down normally through the day. And, um, it's a very important, um, it's a very important lesson for, for people. And I still recommend people do that because they don't realize how significant stress will affect them and how quickly it will affect them. And, um, and again, once we recognize stress, we usually can adapt to it better. All about becoming more aware of the signals of the body, right? It, it truly is. So, so over the years, a lot more tools have come onto the market. Like we now see things like the aura ring, like m measuring like heart rate variability. Um, we see different sleep tracking devices. There, there's power meters for running. You have initially focused a lot on, on heart rate. Are you now looking at some of these other devices as well, or are you mostly still heart rate focused? Well, heart rate is a is an easy thing, uh, and today uh, everyone is aware um, that it, it's easy to measure, and almost everybody has a device to measure their heart rate. In the beginning, uh, none of that was possible, and um, I had to explain as much about this heart monitor that I was using as what the person should be doing while while running. And in the beginning, runners were the vast majority of, of the athletes I had because we were in the, you know, in the early stages of this running boom. And there were hardly any cyclists. Um, triathlon was something from far away in California and Hawaii. And uh, it hadn't gotten to the New York people yet, although um, I, I was aware of it early on, but um, 
And when power meters came out, now we could actually measure power directly. Um, and But I've, I've worked with um, athletes in virtually all sports, so I've had to adapt to whatever their measurements are. And so we could take um, uh, a soccer player, for example, and and discuss how they can improve toward the end of the match in a way that their energy stays high, their aerobic function is still high because they're now burning still more fat, even though they've been through all these stresses. Um, and But heart rate's still a, a great guide. You could use it for a soccer player in, in the, you know, when they're, um, when they're training, um, although, uh, soccer players, basketball players, um, everyone in team sports, I will often have them wear a heart monitor during training so they could see uh, how much they fatigue over the period of the game or the match. And it, it's really a, uh, talk about being aware, it's really a very important thing. And then over time, that fatigue is less and less. And so... Um, Heart rate's still a good guide, and yeah, the technology is is much improved. We we now have the the earbuds that measure heart rate, which um, are really quite amazing. Um, um, and it's interesting, you know, when I first started using heart monitors, I thought this is a great stepping stone for athletes. I was doing that myself. I thought, okay, I'm going to wear this thing, this biofeedback device. And like all other biofeedback, the goal is to become aware of it, train your brain, and then eventually you can go without that training, without those devices to be on your own because your brain now knows how to do it. And I thought we'll do the same with this heart monitor. Mm -hmm. Athletes will wear it for a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. And then maybe every month or two, they'll do an MAF test, but they'll train in between without it because now they know what a 140 heart rate feels like. They know what a 138 heart rate feels like. Well, that never happened. <laughs> I just wanted to say, like, that yesterday on my two hour run in 90 degrees, so 32 to 2 Celsius, at the beginning, the first 15 minutes, I was pretty accurate where my heart rate was. Yet the cardiac drift happening after an hour and a half, I was two minutes slower towards the end at the same heart rate. And it's hard to estimate that. Absolutely. It's, it's hard. Um, I've seen, I've seen athletes who can do it. Um, I haven't tried it lately, but for, for years I would, I would be able to go out and think, oh, okay, I'm going to run at this heart rate and I'd be running along and I'd look down and finally see, yeah, I am right there. Um, some people can't, a lot of people are unable to do that. It, it uh, is easy, it, easier for me the first 45 minutes when I don't have any cardiac drift or the body doesn't like when, when it's hotter or there's some elevations or hills or at altitude or wind, all these things definitely throw it off a little bit. Lose that. Yeah. We lose that, um, that instinct, that intuition, uh, as we start adding more stress, heat, a uh, wind in particular, because we're not acutely aware of that, um, like we are if we're going to pass a house with two Dobermans. <laughs> um, uh, and you mentioned cardiac drift, and I've written uh, an article about that. Um, it's what it's called, um, but it's a real d deception because it's not a cardiac drift. It's full body fatigue. And even though we're training aerobically, if we are, then we still fatigue aerobically. We have we have aerobic fatigue and we have anaerobic fatigue, and we, of course we can have both. Um, but aerobic fatigue would be uh, just what you described. You got slower because the stress, the environmental stress factors um, fatigued your body, fatigued your aerobic system. So now we run slower after an hour or two because of that fatigue. And the people who develop that aerobic system really well fatigue less and less. Not only do they get faster at the same heart rate, but they also fatigue less over that, say, hour or two. And so after an hour, they may, they may slow down uh, in their uh, pace um, just a, a small amount compared to what originally they did. And that's, 
that's that's your sub max power that is going to help you during virtually all endurance races require that sub max power and um that's so that at the end of the race we're less fatigued yeah. than we than we were before we had that great aerobic system yeah yesterday i will have to say though it was a good eye opener to me how much of an impact temperature can have because probably six months ago i did a maf test and between the first mile and the 18th mile there was only a drop off of about 20 seconds because it, it was a low temperature it was only like probably in the 50s or whatever that is like 10 celsius or something yet when doing it yesterday in particular with sort of the higher uh, higher temperatures and i wasn't that heat acclimated yet i haven't done that many of the long runs yeah absolutely could see that difference so there's a lot of different stresses on the body right we have talked about um, the mental stress We've talked about some of the heat stress, temperature stress, but then I also see quite a few athletes who are trying to start out with a with a math training approach to base building, yet they're still doing five days a week cross training or like high interval training or CrossFit or any of, of these other sports that truly get the heart rate up high. Can you talk a bit more about how some of these stresses can block the progress as well and what's happening with the aerobic development at that point? Yeah, and I'm all for the high intensity training. I'm all for doing whatever um, someone wants to do. If they love doing CrossFit or if they love doing um, weightlifting, heavy weightlifting, uh, if they love doing track workout or whatever, I, I'm I'm all for that. You know, we're 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 in this to have fun. So, um, uh, however, if you really want to improve your aerobic system and become a, a, a healthier and more fit person because you're an endurance athlete in particular, um, you need to establish a, a really great aerobic system, that aerobic base, as Lydia, Lydia called it uh, so many years ago. And um, in order to do that, we really, if we, if we stay with that stress model, we really have to eliminate as much stress as we can. And one big stress for the body is anaerobic training. We'll just call it anaerobic and refer to high intensity training, heart rates that are higher than that submax, that MAF heart rate, um, or weight training where we lift uh, uh, weights to fatigue and it takes us 48 hours or 72 hours to recover. Um, likewise, um, a high intensity training workout requires more recovery time. And part of the stress comes in because these high intensity workouts um, produce things like lactic acid and um, uh, induce stress and cortisol comes into play and, and that impairs um, fat burning uh, potentially. Um, when, we're, when we have a great aerobic system, it's much less of a problem or not a problem initially. Um, but the recovery factor is the other potential stress. If we uh, say do a high intensity training uh, run or a track workout on Monday, and then Tuesday we go for our one hour aerobic run, well, we're not recovered yet from the previous day's workout. And that lack of recovery yet we're still training is a source of stress. It's a significant stress um, because when we are in that fatigued state, uh, in that recovery state, uh, we are physically weak. Our muscles are weaker. Uh, our metabolism is less able to to function uh, aerobically. Like I said, the, the the fat burning is impaired. So technically, we should be not training at all or going for a walk as part of the recovery process. And once we're recovered, then we can do our normal MAF run. And so that that routine uh, will not let you build the aerobic system. So that that important feature of MAF is that you need to spend a period of time, could be three months, four, five, six months in some cases, longer in people who have really 
been seriously injured um, or or overtrained, um, that three to six month base building period is really vital. Then you can add literally anything you want. Um, and all of, all along the way, monitor yourself. Because if, and I, I often say to people, do anything you want, but monitor your aerobic pace, monitor that MAF heart rate um, on your MAF test or your submax test. Because if your submax function starts diminishing, Whatever you're doing isn't working. Whatever you're doing is unhealthy. And um, if you're willing to sacrifice your health for more fitness, that's that's a sad situation. Yes. No, it, it, it really is. And I, I do see that some athletes indeed experience that right away where they start to implement higher intensity training and all of a sudden the next day they become a lot slower or they might have to go back to a walk pace. Uh, if they if they were able to to run normally, then they do a high intensity, and then that following day, they might have to like take more walk breaks. You could see it in their gait. You yeah. could, I mean, there's so many measurable factors that you could say, oh, well, look at this, look what's happening here. And the gait is, well, even the posture, even yeah. static posture, uh, you could see because you're, you're creating muscle weakness in, in some of the muscles during that, it's a, I call it the weakness window after the high, high intensity training. Um, and that is associated with muscle imbalance, which gives you the irregular posture. And as soon as you start running the irregular gait and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And then sometimes though, at the other hand, if you do indeed train more consistently and you've been out there for like six months, 12 months of training. I have also noticed that all of a sudden you do a higher intensity workout and the next day you do feel pretty okay. Like I think it also depends to some extent how hard you push yourself on those workouts, right? Because some people just go all out, no pain, no gain on those workouts and they do them simply too long or too hard that the next day they're much more compromised than, than they would if they actually hold back slightly. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There's There's two issues there. One is that when we have a really good aerobic foundation, we recover much faster from a high intensity workout or race or, or even a whole season of, of racing. But also um, when we when we do something that's high intensity, we need to really, I mean, the whole aerobic development process is individual. That's the whole idea of uh, figuring out your MAF heart rate and being honest and accurate with the 180 formula and and monitoring your MAF test to make sure things are actually working. So there's that uh, discipline. But we have to apply the same personalization to high intensity training. If I could run a 10K in 40 minutes and I'm trying to get faster and I get on the track and I run whatever distance that equals um, a 530 pace, obviously that's way faster than I'm going to be able to race, way faster. So we're inducing a lot more stress than we need to. And people have taken that crazy no pain, no gain concept of we have to, we have to train fast to race fast. Well, it doesn't, it, it's not, you know, it's not an open system. We can't just say, oh, yes, if I do 100 meter sprints all out, I'll be able to run a faster 10K or marathon. It, it just doesn't work that way. Um, uh, so, so we need to personalize that high intensity training, uh, whether it's weights or track work or uh, fart lick on the road, which is my favorite thing, because uh, it's it's your brain allowing you to set the workout. Um, and when your brain does that, you typically don't go way beyond your goal pace for whatever your, your next race is going to be. I, I, I want to transition for a little bit to, to another topic here. Um, recently, I saw that you and your team have been working really hard behind the scenes on developing a math foundation course. 
and very excited to see the program launch. Can you talk a little bit more about what the course entails and, and who do you think can benefit from this? Sure, it's been very exciting. Uh, this is, um, of course, I've been lecturing uh, my whole career, but this is really the first time that um, I've worked with a team, a, a very, uh, very efficient team. Um, Alicia has been um, spearheading this. Uh, uh, my my partner, Phil Wing, has been very involved. Um, and we have people like Esther Galindo, who, who works with our Spanish speaking audience and um, Yvonne Rivera, who's been with us and, and Hal Walter, who's my editor, who um, has been uh, working with me for, gosh, three years, three decades on and off um, now. And people know, know Hal as the guy who races burrows. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so these people have all been very successful personally and they've all been on board uh, with us for uh, quite some time now. And so they have all participated in the process as well. And um, so we now have our certified MAF coaches who are doing some of the teaching alongside uh, of, of, of me. And it's just very excited. And this is a um, this is a 10 hour online course. You go as you please. And it's a course that um, would be useful for anyone who is going to help other people. So a coach, a trainer, um, a doctor, a health practitioner. Um, plus, it's important for uh, serious athletes who really want to understand the MAF system um, at a higher level. But it's also it's also great for, for a beginner who's, you know, thinking about MAF and, um, you know, the, the, the MAF is, is really quite simple, but there's a lot of little pieces <laughs> to it. Yeah. And so, um, so some people who just, just start looking at, at what I've been doing and, um, uh, think, you know, I, I need to, I need to finally get my health and fitness uh, uh, straight. Um, they often say, "Well, where do I start?" And this this um, this course will will get you going in the right direction without um, the confusion that that some people have. Although it, it is really quite simple, uh, the problem often is that. We've heard so many other things about how to train, how to eat, uh, how to manage stress, and a lot of those things are just wrong, um, it, especially because they don't build health and fitness at the same time and increase your ability to reach your athletic potential. So the MAF has it all built in, and this course um, presents that in a... Um, in a very organized way, very logical, high quality way as an online course, which is appropriate now with, because, um, I mean, I've had, I've had lectures canceled and, and, uh, I see a lot of conferences that have been canceled. I, I did a, a conference the other day online, you know, they, they, they scrambled and said, let's not do this conference. Oh, let's do it online. And uh, it, it worked out really, really well. And so um, uh, we've been planning this for months. Uh, I've been planning it for years. Um, and to, to be honored with all these people that have learned MAF and are certified coaches is, is just, it's just a wonderful thing. Yeah, there's definitely a big undertake or, or, or a big shift in society towards online learning, which is very exciting to see. Very, yes, it is. Many good, good online resources available right now. This must have been such a massive undertaking for you and your team to develop all of this. It, it has been. It, it, is, it, it is a massive undertaking, and it's the first of many. Um, um, and what's nice is it's it's even better than going to a conference uh, in not only the obvious ways, um, but but 
it's a course you can take at your own pace. Yeah. You can do a little bit, uh, then come back and, and re relook at some of those issues and uh, do it over a period of um, of hours or days or weeks or months. So yeah. um, it it's it's just it's got all the all the things that I've ever wanted in one in one course. How exciting! No, I, I I had a look and it looks very impressive. A lot of details on the website. Can you let us know what website people can find out more about this? It's at my health and fitness website, philmaffetone.com. And if you get on there, you'll see um, you'll see some uh, some links you can click to get to that page and um, read about it. And we're just so we just um, we just announced it uh, uh, this week, I think. And so um, we'll have other announcements to our our members who who get their normal weekly uh, articles and, and other updates, but. Uh, anyone coming to the website will will be able to get to that um, uh, course page and see exactly uh, what's going on with it. I like the self-pacing of any program purely because something that you and I have talked about previously already, and I want to dive into this a little bit more, is every athlete is different. Some athletes have a lot of other things going on in their life. They have multiple kids that they have to take care of. They have a full-time job. They have other commitments in life. And other athletes just have much more time available in their, in their life. And so being able to adjust that accordingly is great. Um, I want to talk briefly about the subject of like who works math training for best because sometimes i hear different comments and i'd rather have you address this because i have my own thoughts and i've shared some of them uh, but the topic of does math training work better for men than for women or for younger athletes are much more easier and more successful with this than older athletes can you talk a bit more about this sure um <clears throat> uh maf works for everyone um, I've seen it work for horses as well. Um, but, but if you're human, it's going to work. Um, and if it appears to not work, if you're not getting faster after a couple of weeks or after a month or certainly after two months, it's not because it doesn't work. Um, and it's probably not because you're not human. It's because something is interfering with your progress. There are some health factors or some fitness factors that are interfering and that that is often um, a dietary factor, but it could be that you've chosen the wrong MAF heart rate. Um, so what, what I've always asked people to do is to think of themselves and be an active participant in this process, not be a passive participant where you read um, a, a diet. Okay. I'm going to follow these. I'm going to eat these foods and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll lose weight. Well, we know that doesn't work likewise for training. Oh, here's a, here's the latest training program. Um, I'm going to, it says I have to run a hundred miles a week to run a, a better marathon. I guess I need to do that. Well, that can ruin your training life, uh, uh, as it has many, many people. Um, so, I'm asking people to participate actively in the process. So you um, you look at the 180 formula and you plug in your specific health and fitness factors and you come up with a heart rate. If you if you lie about uh, your your health, if you say, well, yeah, I'm on three medications, but they're not they're not really affecting me. So I don't have to make the adjustment for medications. You're just fooling yourself. Um, the, the important thing is that the MAF test or, or the, the ability to get faster at the same heart rate is such a powerful concept. Just let's look at it from a conceptual standpoint. That, that concept is so potent uh, in the beginning, I thought, oh, this is a great health guide. If you're getting healthy, 
uh, you're going to be able to walk faster, run faster at the same heart rate. And I didn't think of it as so much as a, as a endurance sports training tool. Um, and it, it does that, but, um, it's turned into something that everyone can use, but you need to be an active participant and, 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 uh, uh, match your health and fitness needs, uh, with, with, uh, all that's being done. So the fact that you're told something is blocking your health, blocking your fitness is such a significant uh, feature of MAF because uh, most people guess, most people wait until they do their first race only to realize this is not working. I've just wasted 10 weeks of training and I'm really no better off. So we, we want to, we want to measure, we want to be objective as objective as uh, we can be with the human body. Uh, we we want to know for sure. We want to take the guesswork out of training, take the guesswork out of uh, food choices that are going to work best for us. And that that um, idea that some people, it, you know, it doesn't work for some people, uh, just isn't true. Men and women, yeah, I, I, I've I've heard. Um, the back and forth on that. Oh, it, it works for men better than women. Oh, it works for women better than men. We could rationalize how that can happen. Men have more muscle. Uh, women are better fat burners. Uh, but what? But what about factors like hormonal changes throughout the month or at certain ages? That would would not, that would not that not factor, Im impact uh, math to that it, extent? I, it, it long term, no, certainly not. Uh, short term, it could, but again, just like we talked about with you and the heat, uh, our our brain adapts to those yeah. hormonal changes. And if we uh, go out for a run on a day when our hormones are naturally out of balance, and I say naturally because a lot of people have significant hormonal imbalance, which will correct itself in most cases when people get healthier. But if we go out on the wrong day, the wrong time, uh, and um, uh, and certain hormones are doing their thing at those times in men or women, uh, we have we all have changes in in hormones. Then it will affect our our pace for sure. But over a long term, it's not going to be significant. Right on. I'm 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 glad you you shared that here. Yeah, and you know the age the age thing is is another uh, misconception. Uh, when we're younger, as we all know, uh, we're 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 faster, we're stronger, we recover quickly, we can abuse ourselves and not notice it as much. Um, uh, and as we age, our reaction times slow down. We start losing muscle mass. Uh, we're not as quick. Uh, we recover a little slower, even even when we're healthy. Um, and so all these things have to be considered. But the fact is, whether we're 60, 70, or 80, or 18, or 20, 25, it's going to work the same. The rate of improvement may be a little different. It It's something that we will see slow down as we age, which is not unusual. Um, we may hit our peaks at, at different points. Um, uh, but, but the fact is, um, age is not a factor. What's a factor is health. It's like the thing being a 60 or 65 or 70 year old does not increase our vulnerability to infections. What increases our vulnerability is poor health and people who are 60, 65, 70 are generally a lot uh, unhealth, more unhealthy, um, and 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 so there's a larger number of 60 plus who are getting infections and dying. Uh, it's comorbidity. Uh, so it, and then the other part is the the body fat content. There are more, um, generally speaking, there are as we get older we. We increase body fat, and people who have excess body fat are mostly uh, the ones who are getting sick and dying of, 
of in other infections as well. More um, insulin resistance as you age as well, as I've heard you previously. Correct. That's a that's a factor, um, and that's a that's a good point because we do become more insulin resistant, more carbohydrate intolerant as we age, which in itself is not necessarily a problem if we adapt to it. And the only way we can adapt to rising rates of insulin resistance or carbohydrate intolerance is to eat less carbohydrate as we age. And so um, uh, people over time uh, should be eating lower and lower amounts of natural carbohydrates. The, the, the junk food carbohydrates, nobody should be eating. Uh, but then the question is, okay, what about natural carbs like fruits and lentils and beans? Uh, these things are fine, but you have to match, you have to individualize it. You have to match your needs. And if your need uh, for uh, lentils and beans, for example, or fruits is, um, is here, but your insulin resistance is higher, then you, you need to make an adjustment. Even though those are natural foods, you need to reduce some of them to a point where your, um, your metabolism is not affected by them. That makes a lot of sense. Recently, I had uh, Matt Fitzgerald from 8020 running on the podcast. And we had a great conversation about uh, one of the latest books that he wrote that was Running the Dream, where he actually joined an elite running camp at Altitude and to really see what the max of his performance was going to be. Because he still, even in his mid-40s, had some really big PR goals that he wanted to go after. And when yesterday I re-listened to some of our previous uh, podcast conversations that you and I have had, and I heard you say that many athletes don't hit their aerobic peak until well into their 40s. And me now, like, like getting into the late 30s, um, going into the 40s soon, it really got me excited. Both of these things, both of what Matt said and what you've been saying as well about aerobic peak not happening for many athletes until well into their 40s. Can you talk a little bit more about that part, about the aerobic peak and how that develops, um, like especially into the 40s as well? Yeah, I think the uh, there's, there's two ways to describe that. One is the sort of a generic approach with human physiology. Um, and then we have to we have to say, well, what are what are humans normally do? They normally progress, and when we start looking at race pace and submax training pace uh, and physical abilities, we have to bring in strength and muscle function and all of that stuff. Uh, and you put it all together, and you seem to have a peak in the 40s. And we see uh, we see athletes who, you know, as they get past what people think of is their prime. Uh, Mark Allen winning the Ironman, uh, you know, at a, at a later age, beating a lot of those young, young guys who, you know, are, were incredible athletes. Mike Pig did the same thing. Priscilla Welch won the New York City Marathon at age 42. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had plenty of athletes who in their 40s were uh, winning races and beating, you know, good, good runners who were 10, 15 years younger. Um, so there's the clinical part, there's the physiological part that we can look at. Um, but again, we have to look at individual circumstances. And so the big question is, okay, you peak in your 40s. The question is, when did you begin this uh, development? Yeah, that's such did, a good point. If you began at age 35 because you thought, okay, I'm gonna, I got to get off the couch and start training, and you do, and now you're running better and better, and at 45 you run a PR for your 10K or your marathon or whatever, um, well, there's a good chance you're going to run a PR at age 50 as well. And we're not talking about the category of 50s. We're talking about um, the open, you know, your, your overall event. Um, it's conceivable you could run your best race and peak at age 55. So it depends. Um, but there's always a limit because the human body has limits. Um, and, uh, uh, 
one of the nice things about age group performance is that you have another goal that you can say, hey, I've run my my marathon PR at age 55. Um, now I'm going to run a, when I'm 60, I'm going to prepare for that 60 category. Uh, and now I'm, I'm racing against my peers and it, it's, you know, it's, it's a big, um, uh, it's a big part of the process. It's one of the fun things that, that people, uh, can do. And, and so that's, you know, uh, I, I think the the tradition of the peak is that we uh, we we peak at age you know 25 or 30. That's a myth, uh, and also we peak uh, every every year, um, and we can only see that peak after we've passed it. Um, and I I don't like peaks. I think we just get faster and faster in the course of a season and in the course of your you know, your, your, um, your years, depending again on w where you started. Um, and, and th those, those are not myths. Those are real things. And the aerobic system is not dependent on sprint speed. You know, th those, uh, dependencies have a big genetic feature. Uh, if you're a hundred meter racer, then those are factors, but, um, most of us are not not doing that at least right now well that uh, that excites me so much about this training approach though seeing many athletes in their 40s 50s 60s all running prs um with this approach it just seems more focused on becoming a healthier stronger happier runner this way really um and and this is where i also like i'm so glad that i found this training approach when i did because i know it will like not beat me up to a point that I will get injured all over the time, but I can continue running healthy for many years to follow. So absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's another, it's another given that people think, um, you know, we're going to be an athlete and we're going to compete at a high level for just short period of time because athletic careers are short, right? Well, uh, athletic careers are considered short because so many people are unhealthy and um, it's health that shortens their career, uh, not their fitness. And if we can get healthy, just the fact that we get healthier will lengthen our fitness career. And so wherever we're at, if we're a, a professional athlete, uh, extending the career by being healthy is a, a wonderful thing to do, obviously. And then if we're an amateur, um, the same thing. We can work our way up the age groups and perform really well. And if we just want to be fit and, you know, do uh, whatever workouts we want to do because it's most enjoyable to us, the same thing applies. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we, we often talk about this holistic training approach with focusing on the running component, on, on stress management, on nutrition. And then there are also many other elements like the, the strength training, the mobility, flexibility, cross training. You've previously mentioned to be careful with stretching. Can you clarify the reasoning and do you suggest, what, what do you really suggest athletes to do to work on their mobility and flexibility? Yeah, this is a, this is an ongoing issue. Um, and in, in the beginning, uh, as a clinician, what I noticed uh, was that people who stretched were injured more than people who didn't stretch. Actually, way back, people who didn't stretch were embarrassed to say they didn't stretch because they thought, well, you had to do this. Uh, but intuitively, they knew not to stretch. So I had enough people in both camps. Um, I was also able to show clinically that if we stretch a muscle, if we stretch a ligament, um, it can affect muscle function uh, quite quickly. Um, and um, as the years went by, and I would recommend people not stretch, uh, what I wanted them to do was improve their flexibility. And I discovered early on that a great aerobic system improved flexibility because the muscles that control joint movements to a large degree were those slow twitch red aerobic muscle fibers. And so 
building the aerobic system uh, meant they had better flexibility if, and only if, they warm up properly before their run because that warm up is what develops flexibility um, quite well. It actually develops flexibility as much as stretching would. If we just look at, well, stretching increases flexibility, well, aerobic function will do that as well and will will they'll they'll be equal and now we have okay they're equal uh but stretching now increases the risk for injury so we wonder why we even bother stretching if we did ballet if we were gymnasts if we were um in sports that required that extreme range of motion then i'm okay with doing properly done doing some stretching after only after a warm-up is done um, and still, those, those athletes tend to be very sensitive to injury. They, they are, are injured more even when they're seemingly doing everything right because they're always on the edge. Endurance athletes don't need to be on the edge. Um, but what I was finding as the years went by is there were, were more and more studies showing that, number one, we don't know if stretching is important. We don't know if stretching is healthy or not. We know that in these studies, stretching was harmful. So I think today, um, to say stretching should be avoided, people don't people don't uh, look at you funny like they used to. Um, and so I think it's sort of stood the test of time, as they say. Um, and uh, the big question is, how much flexibility do you need? Um, if, if you think you need a lot of flexibility, the fact is the more flexible we are, the more risk we are at risk we are of getting injured because joints, as they move far from their normal ranges of motion, uh, increase that injury risk significantly. So, um, uh, th those are more of the questions that should be asked. And, and, you know, a lot of people are in a hurry when they do their workout, they're all short for time, almost all of them. And, and so they rush everything. They don't warm up properly. And they, and now you're asking them to, to stretch, which is something that requires properly done, very slow uh, activity uh, of a lot of different muscles. And most people don't have time to do that. So they rush and bounce and do all the things that they say not to do and they do them anyway. And so. Right on. Yeah. Does it, the, the power of the warm up can absolutely not be underestimated. And I've, I've personally experienced that as well. It, it, it's amazing. It, it's really, really amazing. I was, I was, uh, you know, it was one of the astonishing things I, I saw in early in my career, how much of a physiological change we were able to measure in someone who starts their workout with a walk, they start walking faster, they start jogging, and then they start, then they reach their MAF heart rate. The 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 physiological changes that occur occur are just amazing with increasing fat burning, increasing flexibility, increased oxygenation, lung capacity. Um, and of course the the cool down is is important too because it's a it's the first stage of recovery, and we talked about how important recovery was. But cooling down is important too, and uh, you know it's it's part of that MAF workout where you warm up, you reach your MAF heart rate, you stay there until about twelve to fifteen minutes before you finish when you start cooling down. Yeah, tell the body that the workout is over. <laughs> Um, I want to be respectful of your time here. I have a few last questions um, that I want to make sure I ask you. So there have been a few or there have been several key people that have made a big impact in my life. If I have to mention a few, for example, Ryan Holiday from The Daily Dad or Carl Newport from Digital Minimalism or from Deep Work or Tim Ferriss from The 4-Hour Workweek. But you have made a big impact in my life as well. And I just want to say thank you for that because the, the work that you have written and the, the work you have put out have, have truly like made me a stronger, healthier and happier athlete, but also 
played a big role in, in other areas of my life. I just want to ask you, like, do you have any heroes, any mentors or anyone else who has made a big impact in your life? Sure. Um, and I want to just thank you for, for, for saying that. I think, um, you know, the, the greatest, for me, the greatest joy is to see uh, someone, to see people uh, respond to uh, some of my suggestions. That, that was the purpose of me getting into all this to begin with. I had a passion to help people. And I wasn't sure exactly where I was going to go. All I knew was I want to help people. And when I can see that someone has been helped, I, I can't explain the, the, the joy that brings me. And so, so, um, so thank you for that. Um, I've, you know, <clears throat> I don't know where to begin with, with uh, the, the people who have influenced me. Um, I've written about some of them uh, in articles and books, um, and uh, uh, many of them I don't know because they're researchers who did studies that uh, uh, confirmed a lot of things I saw clinically, which is another wonderful thing for a clinician to say, hey, this is what I'm finding in my practice. I don't care if it's scientific or not. I'm using it because it works. And then all of a sudden you, you read in a journal, hey, we tested these, these subjects and we found this. Oh, hey, that's what I was finding, but I didn't have the scientific expl explanations. And that process has been going on and on throughout my career. And, and many, of those, um, many of those researchers are the unsung heroes in my life. Um, I, I remember some of the names, uh, McGardle, uh, who was the, the author on that famous uh, exercise physiology textbook, one of the authors, uh, Mountcastle, one of the famous uh, physiologists that uh, we all had to study in school. Um, but along the way, people that I uh, interacted with, Tim Noakes, um, I, I learned about Tim when he was... Um, just getting started in his career. And I didn't know who he was. I just read about uh, his study, his very first study, I think, which was um, on marathon runners <laughs> and heart disease. And um, it, was, it was interesting because I was seeing all these athletes who were unhealthy. And I didn't, I didn't have my health fitness paradigm quite yet. Um, that hit me when I was running the New York city marathon. Um, but Tim was saying, Hey, marathon runners and heart problems in the same title. Um, and it was just fascinating. And then I, I kind of followed up with him on his research that followed. And he, he was one of the few that talked about fat burning and, um, that kind of stuff. Um, that was also one of the biggest books that I own as well. Tim Noakes' book. <laughs> it's like 1500 pages or something like that. Yes. Yes. Uh, and Tim and I have, have gotten to be great colleagues and we've not physically met yet, but we've, um, we're getting there. We're almost <laughs> <laughs> right on, um, early on, uh, George Sheehan, of course, the, 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 the running guru mm -hmm. philosopher, However, you know him. I, I know George as a, a a colleague and really friend um, in the in the uh, early years of my career. And George um, George wrote. Uh, he, he was just a, a, an amazing character. George wrote a forward for one of my first books, and you know you ask people to write a forward, and sometimes they say, "Oh yeah, sure," and they write some generic thing. Well. Not George. He wanted to, first of all, find out really what I was all about, and he did, and and he had to instill the G, the the Sheehan philosophy into it, and and he talked about things that I wasn't even talking about. Uh, this holistic concept. I, I talked about it. I knew about it, 
myself, but I didn't talk about it because it was something that, you know, that's a little too much for people. You know, it's bad enough that they're hearing train slow to run fast and uh, don't eat, you know, refined carbohydrates uh, when you're a runner in the 70s. I mean, who did that? Uh, who heard that? So George, you know, got philosophical and he went back to the Greeks and play, you know, Plato and and it was such a an amazing uh, experience to 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 read what George wrote and to talk philosophy with George and uh, and so he was a he was a big um, uh, hero of mine as well and you know I've 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 be became friends with with some of the researchers I only read about uh, Paul Larson. Uh, who I um, often write papers with because Paul is, um, uh, he's, you know, he's a great physiologist and now he's starting to coach and, um, and uh, Dan Plews, uh, who uh, they used to work together and Dan has been, uh, a, a, you know, an MAF uh, supporter for many years. Dan has the Iron Man record. I know his his name keeps coming up even when talking to Triathlon Terran. He brought his name up as well. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dan and Paul, uh, among the 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 MAF coaches I mentioned earlier, they're all founding MAF coaches, and um, uh, they, you know, I look up I look up to them in in many ways uh, as well because they they understand the physiology of this and I'm understanding it better and better, uh, as the years go by. Um, I wrote, uh, with Paul, I wrote uh, the paper on MAF that came out earlier this year, um, which I've been wanting to write really my whole career. And I, I finally, when I got out of practice 20 years ago, I finally decided I was going to do some of these scientific uh, research projects. I would, I did a textbook, you know, finally having time to do that. And, and, um, finally just got to that MAF paper, which is, if you want to read the science of MAF, that paper has, um, a lot of, a lot of details. And we'll, we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes as well. Yeah. Definitely. Two two last questions. Where can people find more about your work, your your different books that you have written? What would be the best resource for that? Well, the books, uh, you, you could see all the books that are out there if you do a simple search. But the, the big book of uh, endurance training and racing, the big yellow book, as it's called, is uh, is one of the most comprehensive books for for endurance athletes. And the big book of health and fitness, which is the big red book, is uh, a book for everyone else. The other books, a lot of them are getting outdated. Um, all books are outdated once they hit the market. <laughs> so um, the, the big yellow book and the big red book are outdated as well. But people can go to my website, website philmaffetone.com, and there's probably over 400 articles. They're all free. Um, that they will see that I've written since those books came out, uh, or I've I've updated them since those books came out. So there's a lot of uh, material there. Plus, there's an interactive um, uh, mechanism where people can say, "Okay, I'm going to start this MAF program," and they can go there and and be guided through a process that individualizes their um, their MAF program. So that's, um, that's a, a very important component as well. And every week, uh, like I alluded to earlier, every week I, I write a new article. Um, uh, I haven't run out of things to write about yet. And then the newsletter is a great way to stay up to date with the latest, right? People, you know, if you're a member, uh, which is also free, you'll get that in your mailbox every week and see what, uh, what's going on. So much covered over here in this conversation again and in our previous two conversations. Do you have any closing thoughts, any high level suggestions for athletes looking to further improve and to become a stronger, healthier and happier athlete? 
You know, Floris, we could talk for hours about, <laughs> we can. about that um, issue, which we won't do uh, now. Um, but but I, I, I want to say one very, very important thing, which is that we're in this for fun. We're in this to be happy. There's nothing greater than being healthy and fit. There's nothing that will bring happiness than being healthier and, and knowing how to become even healthier still and also uh, with fitness, you know, to see that we're now able to run at a faster pace at the same level of intensity, at the same heart rate, or generate more power. Um, what a what a happy feeling that is. And 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 being in a race and having fun if your goal is to race, being able to have unlimited energy, being able to have a wonderful brain that uh, that is really sharp no matter what your age. These are these are the things that that bring happiness and are fun and, and we can't forget the fun part in all that we're we're doing. So well said right there. Dr. Phil Mephitone, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on the show again and look forward to continue the conversation again down the line. Thank you, Flores. All right. Have a good one. Bye now. Thank you so much for listening. Every time again, when I have a conversation with Dr. Phil Mephitone, there's several great takeaways again. And I would love to hear from you. What was one key takeaway, a lesson, or your favorite quote from today's podcast? Please let me know in the comments section. Also, as a reminder, there is an Enter to Win contest to win one of three Pyrenees hooded running shirts. And this is truly my favorite long sleeve running short shirt that I never really want to take off. I wear it for running, but I wear it after running as well. And I've even on colder days used it as a pajama. It comes with the actual GPS um, slot. So you can look at your GPS watch uh, in the opening of the shirt. It has the hand warmers and the snorkel hood as well. And we're giving away three of these hooded shirts at pathprojects.com slash flow. So um, yeah, three lucky winners will be chosen over there. Like Dr. Phil Mephitone said, it is all about having fun in your workouts. And I think that is such an important takeaway for myself as well. Once again, just that reminder. So I want to say to each and every one of you out there, absolutely have fun and enjoy your workouts out there. See you on the next podcast. Bye now.